Hello and welcome to module 1 of the Amadeus SAS Macro course. The aim of this module is to provide a general introduction to macro language and give you a feel for what can be achieved using macros and macro variables. We'll also take a look at some practical examples demonstrating how we can use macro language to solve everyday coding problems. Please make sure to download the supporting materials that accompany this module from the Amadeus website. We hope you enjoy the course. This module will focus on the following areas. To start with, we will introduce SAS Macro and explain where it fits in within the SAS system. We'll then discuss some of the benefits of macro language and explain just why it's such an important and powerful tool which every programmer should understand and have at their disposal. We'll then explore some of the central concepts behind macro language, which include the key symbols used. And to finish off, we'll take a look at a number of programming challenges which can be overcome using macro-based solutions. Firstly, let's take a look at how SAS Macro fits into the SAS system as a whole. The SAS system is made up of a series of modules, each of which providing different capabilities. SAS Macro forms part of the base SAS module, which is the foundation of all SAS installations. This means that SAS Macro language is available to every SAS programmer, irrespective of what components they may have licensed. One of the main benefits of macro language is that it can be used in conjunction with any other component of SAS language, integrating seamlessly into our code. As we will see, it allows us to automate programming steps to provide a greater degree of flexibility within our programs. What can SAS macro do for us? It provides the ability to parameterize our programs. This has the benefits of making our programs more flexible and easier to maintain. It can also be used to automate repetitive tasks. For example, a proc tabulate which could be repeated 12 times, or perhaps a number of times determined by a condition, need only be programmed once. One of the most obvious benefits of using macro language is the ability to create programs which are reusable. This can be achieved by using parameters to substitute text into the parts of our programs that most commonly change over time, or with different data inputs. This allows us to directly influence the code that is run, without needing to manually change it. In a similar fashion, we can easily control what parts of a program are to be run. As an example, we could write a program which generates reports but provides the user with the ability to dynamically control their structure and content. In addition to all of this, SAS Macro provides a variety of ways to package up and share reusable code, which may be useful to other users. This extends all of the benefits we've discussed around efficiency and productivity to not just one SAS programmer, but an entire group. The two concepts that are central to macro language are that of macro variables and macros. Macro variables share some similarity with dataset variables in that they can both be used to store data and they both follow the same naming conventions. So what is a macro variable? Well, let's start by considering a traditional SAS process where for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm a data step, my colleague here is a proc step, and this is the piece of information that we would like to hand between steps. In a traditional process, we would save this information as a variable inside a data set, and once that data set has been output, it's then free for our procedure to access the variable contained. So, how does that compare with how we save information using macro language? Well, let's consider exactly the same demonstration where I'm a data step, my colleague here is a proc step. This is still the same piece of information I would like to save, but this time we're going to save it as a macro variable. And macro variables are saved in an area of memory called a symbol table. 
Once that information has been placed in the symbol table, it's now free for any subsequent step running in our SAS session to access. So, as we've seen, macro variables are held in memory, which means they can be easily accessed throughout a SAS session, whether it be through macro code or using traditional data steps and proc steps. It therefore provides a convenient way of passing values from one step to another. Another difference is in the way macro variables store their values. Dataset variables can be one of two types, numeric or character. In contrast, macro variables store data in character form. So, what is a SAS macro? Well, let's imagine that this piece of paper represents a SAS process made up of a number of data and proc steps. When we compile a macro, we take these steps and bundle them together into a single object, giving it a specific name. This is then stored in a central location and is now available to this SAS session and any other SAS session. When the macro is called, SAS opens the macro definition and executes the statement held within. So, as we've seen, macros allow us to package reusable or repetitive code into something which is executable. The process of packaging the code is referred to as compilation. Quite what that code contains is down to the discretion of the programmer. It can contain an entire program which is to be run on a regular basis or just part of a statement. Once a macro has been compiled, it can then be used by issuing a macro call. There are two symbols that enable us to work with macro variables and macros, the ampersand and the percent sign. The ampersand character, when followed by a non-blank character, is an instruction to resolve a macro variable. The term resolving refers to the process of returning the value of a macro variable. So for example, if we were to type ampersand sysdate in a SAS program, this would instruct SAS to return the value held in the macro variable sysdate. An instruction to resolve a macro variable within a program will therefore substitute its value at the precise point where it was referenced in the code. The percent sign has many purposes in macro language. It can be used to issue a macro call, for example, percent %age would run the macro called age. It is also used to denote a reserved keyword in macro language. For example, the following if statement will be understood to be a macro if statement, purely because the keyword and all of its dependent keywords are prefixed with a percent sign. So, what have we learned so far? We've seen that macro language provides us with numerous benefits. Remember, maintainability, flexibility, reusability, and efficiency from sharing code. We've also defined the two main concepts of macro language, macro variables, which are held in memory, and macros, which allow us to package up code. And we've seen the two symbols which are used in conjunction with macro variables and macros, the ampersand and the percent sign. When should we consider using these techniques? The following demonstrations will illustrate some of the situations where macro language is needed to solve day-to-day -day programming problems. This first program demonstrates a common reporting problem, that of adding today's date to a title of a report. Our first attempt to do this makes use of a data step and the today function to dynamically load the current date into a data set variable which is then added to a title statement. Looking at the results, we can see that this approach was unsuccessful, mainly because the title statement treats all of the text specified in quotes as literal text. This problem can be solved by making use of a macro variable instead of a data set variable. Notice how the data step has been removed and the title statement has been updated. The reference to ampersand sysdate instructs us to return the value of a macro variable called sysdate at the precise point it's referenced. Sysdate is an example of what is known as an automatic macro variable, which contains the date that the SAS session was started. 
The second problem shows an attempt to conditionally process insurance policy data based on the type of insurance policy assigned to a customer. The intention is to produce a listing of all life insurance records but to perform analysis on motor insurance records. Our first attempt sees the use of a data step which reads in the policy's data set and tests the value of type. An if statement is then used to determine what action to perform. Unfortunately, whilst the logic behind this process appears to be sound, this program does break a fundamental rule of SAS language, which is that we are not permitted to embed one programming step within another. This is because of the way that the SAS system runs a SAS program, and specifically how it determines when each step finishes and the next one starts. In this example, SAS begins processing the code at the data step. However, when the keyword PROC is encountered, SAS interprets this as both the end of the data step, but also the start of a new PROC step. If the data step finishes at this point, we can see that there will be errors relating to an unclosed do loop. Both the PROC PRINT and the PROC MEAN steps are self-contained and closed by a run statement, which is syntactically correct, so there will be no problem executing these procedures. Unfortunately, at the point where PROC PRINT is closed, we now have an END and an ELSE statement floating in open code, which is also not permitted. These statements can only be used in a data step, and so not surprisingly, will also trigger errors on execution. Exactly the same issue occurs with the final END statement. The log confirms all of these issues are present on executing the code. Ultimately, these problems are all caused by attempting to embed PROC steps inside a data step. We can solve this problem by taking a slightly different approach. Our requirement is to perform a different action based on the type of insurance data held in the policies table. This can actually be achieved by defining a macro. Notice how in the revised program the data step has been removed and in its place a macro has been defined. Both the name of the procedure and the criteria for a WHERE clause have also been replaced by macro variables. The first call to this macro will ensure that a PROC print is performed on life insurance data. The second macro call will therefore perform a PROC means on motor insurance data. This is the correct way of executing different procedures based on the value of a variable. In the last example, we have a program which attempts to perform 12 tabulations on monthly data sets named DS1 through to DS12. In our first attempt, a data step do loop is used to repeat a PROC tabulate for each table. Unfortunately, this program suffers from the same problem we saw earlier, where a PROC step is embedded within a data step. Errors relating to an unclosed do loop and an end statement floating in open code will be reported in the log. There is, however, a further problem which relates to the use of the index variable i. The current program attempts to use i to change the name of the dataset being processed. Unfortunately, this is not how Proctabulate will interpret this instruction. Proctabulate is not aware of the fact that the letter i is actually a variable to be resolved, and so each iteration of this do loop will attempt to read in the table dsi. On executing the program, all of the problems we've identified are reported as errors in the log, including a message which states that Proctabulate cannot find a dataset called DSI. As one might suspect, the solution to this problem is to replace the data step with a macro, which this time contains a macro do loop. This will create an index variable which is actually a macro variable, identified by ampersand i. This variable will increment from 1 to 12 with each iteration of the do loop. This ensures that 12 separate PROC tabulates are performed on datasets DS1 through to DS12. It should be noted that this program is no more efficient than executing 12 separate PROC tabulates. What it does allow us to do is define the procedure once and then execute it as many times as is required. Consider, for example, 
What revisions to this code will be required to process tables going up to DS100? This module has provided a general introduction to SAS macro language and demonstrated some of the benefits it can provide. As we have seen, macro language consists of two key components, macro variables and macros, and these have been defined alongside the two key delimiters that allow us to work with them, the ampersand and the percent sign. Common applications of using macro language to solve day-to-day -day coding problems have also been explored. Please download the exercises and the course data that accompanies this module from the Amadeus website. These exercises provide an excellent opportunity to practice and apply the techniques covered. That concludes the Introduction to SAS Macro eCourse module. Let's have a quick look at all of the modules in the Amadeus SAS Macro eCourse. Module 1, Introduction to SAS Macro, provides a brief overview of the macro facility and illustrates some of the benefits it provides to SAS programmers. Module 2, How SAS Macro Works, takes a look behind the scenes and shows how SAS Macro interacts with the other components of SAS language. Module 3, Macro Variables, covers the basics of macro variables introducing the concept of the symbol table and highlighting the differences between macro and data step variables. Module 4, Working with Macro Variables, describes the techniques for creating and deleting macro variables, as well as dealing with the issues caused by special characters. Module 5, Macro Variable Resolution, considers how macro variables are resolved and looks specifically at a number of techniques such as multipass resolution. Module 6, Working with Macros, describes how to define and then execute a SAS macro. We will also look at using the different types of macro parameter to pass values into the macro. Module 7, Symbol Table Rules, takes a detailed look at the use of SAS macro symbol tables and how to avoid the potential pitfalls. Module 8, Nested Macros, looks at applications and implications of nesting SAS macros. Module 9, Directing and Debugging Macros, describes how to perform conditional processing within a macro. We also take a look at the debugging tools available within the macro facility. Module 10, Handling Iteration, shows how to automate repetitive programming tasks within a macro. Module 11, Macro Functions, looks at using macro-specific functions to perform tasks such as text manipulation. Module 12, Accessing Functions Using Percent Sysfunc, demonstrates one of the most versatile macro functions and how it provides access to the functionality of other SAS functions. Module 13, Macro Variables in the Data Step, takes a look at how macro variables can be created and resolved within a data step. A number of powerful techniques that leverage this functionality are described in detail. Module 14, Macro Variables in ProcSQL, describes how ProcSQL can be used to create macro variables. Module 15, Numeric Evaluation within Macros, looks at how we can perform numeric calculations and comparisons within the macro language. Also covered are best practices to avoid unexpected results. Module 16, Macro Quoting Functions, describes how and when you need to use macro quoting functions to mask the meaning of special characters. Module 17, Distributed Macros, looks at the different approaches for sharing macros across groups of SAS users. And Module 18, Macro Language Best Practice, finishes the course by discussing general best practices around using SAS macro language. Please read through the accompanying documentation and visit our website for details on further modules within this course. Thank you for watching.